Hey, my name is James. I'm the pastor of The Rising, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, I pray that this message inspires you, encourages you, and motivates you to grow closer to God. So I want to invite you, lean forward, have an expected attitude, and get ready to hear a word from God. I want to remind you, too, that you're not changed by the word that you hear. You're changed by the word that you do. So make sure you put this into practice. Come on, let's listen. You know, when we think about the 2,000 year history of the church, uh, we see God continually and constantly seeking to help people understand that the church is open for all people. Like, one of the things I say quite often, and it's based from the truth of the scriptures, is that God loves you for, for who you are and not as you should be because none of us are as we should be. And, and regardless of who you are, where you've been, and what you've done, God loves you. And I say that statement because it's grace. It's grace, it's grace, it's grace, and God's grace is greater than anything we can imagine, right? It's grace, and it's rooted in the constant progression we see, especially in the book of Acts, where God is showing people that the church, His church, is open to all people. You know, early on, um, when the church first began, Jesus had, had already been crucified, uh, resurrected, and ascended to heaven. And, he's, and he sent his spirit to empower those who followed him on the day of Pentecost uh, in, in those early days. See, see the church uh, was just a handful of people, but then on the day of Pentecost, it grew to 3,000 people. But in those early days, the church was only open for Jews who became Christians, followers of Jesus, right? This is, this is what the leaders of the church thought, that Jesus came to save Jews, God's chosen people. So, so those uh, who could be Christians and part of the church were Jewish converts. That's who the church was open to. And if you read through the book of Acts in the Bible, b- b- because this is the history of the start of the church, what you'll see is that for the first seven chapters, uh, the church is just Jewish converts. And, and then Stephen, the first Christian martyr, is killed, and the church scatters all over the area uh, for fear of persecution. Well, well, Philip, one of, the, one of the Christians who dispersed, traveled to Samaria. And if, you, and if you watched last week, then you know the Jews and Samaritans hated one another, right? I mean, the, the Samaritans were mixed Jews, not pure blood. And there was racism and division amongst the Jews and the Samaritans. Well, well Jesus explained one time that even Samaritans, those people in that other group that you don't like, they're your neighbor and they're people that you should love. So Philip goes to Samaria and, uh, and, he, and he finds that the people there are open to the good news about Jesus. Not only that, but they start speaking in different languages. They're speaking in tongues, which was a sign that they somehow received God's spirit. And, and, and so in Acts chapter 8, Philip reasons, well, I mean, if God has given these half Jews his spirit, then, then maybe he's not just the God of the Jews, but he's also the God of the Samaritans as well. And maybe his church is open even to them. And so he baptizes them. And so, so, so there's this revelation that, okay, well, well, the church isn't just for Jewish converts, but it's also for Samaritans who are in a different group than we are. And so God must be accepting them as well. And then later in Acts chapter 10 uh, and 11, Peter, one of the guys who hung out with Jesus, was asked to come to Cornelius' house. Now, Cornelius was a Gentile. I mean, he wasn't Jewish. He wasn't even half Jewish. Uh, like, he was, he was the opposite of Jewish. And, and Jewish law forbade Peter to go to his house. But, but God showed up to Peter in a vision, letting him know it was okay for him to go to Cornelius' house. And so Peter reluctantly went, even after God told him to go, he reluctantly goes to meet Cornelius and his family, the, the, these people who weren't Jewish or even part of being Jewish like Samaritans, but, but he goes to meet them and he finds that they're open to hearing the good news about Jesus. And then they start speaking in different languages. They start speaking in tongues. Again, this sign that God had given them his Holy Spirit like he did for those followers uh, on the day of Pentecost and like he did for those in, 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 in Samaria. And Peter reasoned, well, uh, I mean, if God has given them his spirit, I guess that means he's accepted even Gentiles. Like pe- people um, who, who have no Jewish background and heritage, I guess he's accepted them too. I guess God's church is open to everyone. 
And so Peter baptizes Cornelius and his family, and, and, and word gets out about this, and the people of the church have a problem with this. The people in the Jerusalem church have a problem with this. We can't have Peter baptizing people who aren't Jewish or Samaritans. So they call Peter into this meeting in Acts chapter 11, and Peter explains what happened. He explains his actions. And after they heard Peter's explanation, here's what their response was. When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God saying, So then, even to Gentiles God has granted repentance that leads to life. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> awesome. I guess, I guess the church is open not only for Jewish and Samaritan converts, but also to Gentiles. I, like, we guess anybody could be a part of the church and accept God's love. And, and here's what I find fascinating about all of this. God uses individuals to help people accept groups, right? God uses individuals to help people accept groups. Like, like when early Jewish Christians thought of Samaritans, they were those half-breeds who had compromised their faith. Jews actually called Samaritans dogs. But then Jesus tells a story about one Samaritan so that people could look past the group stereotypes and see a person. And in Acts chapter 8, God uses a handful of people that Philip met to give greater insight into the whole group. In Acts chapter 10, God introduces Peter to a person so that, we could, so that he could see the whole group differently. See, when we tend to think about groups and, and what we see are groups, it's easy for us to paint with broad brush strokes and make the relationship us versus them, our group versus their group, right? Those black people, those white people, those cops, those gay people, those immigrants, those Republicans, those Democrats, those fill in the blank with whatever group you want, right? When we see groups, it's us versus them. But when we move from a group to a person, now we see that person's story. Now we see their background, their history, their experience, their strengths, their fears. And when we zoom in, to see people at a human level, it can give us greater insight to love and appreciate and care for and empathize with them. Like This is the command we live by if we're Christians. A new command I give you, Jesus said, love one another as I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Here's, here's how this looks practically. For the whole law can be summed up in one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. See, to love our neighbor as ourself, we have to see the individual. You know, there's, there's one more person um, that I want to introduce you to in the opening of the church 2,000 years ago. Uh, that, that same guy, Philip, who was in Samaria, he, he, he was told by God's spirit to run up to a chariot that was traveling down the road. And so Philip runs up to the chariot and inside is an Ethiopian eunuch who's reading from the book of Isaiah. And this man from Ethiopia is black. Philip is Jewish. So Philip, he's Middle Eastern. Probably he has olive skin, right? So they look different from one another. God says, I want you to go to that person who looks different from you. And, and the Ethiopian uh, he isn't Jewish. He's Gentile, which means Philip shouldn't even be interacting with him. Hey, I want you to go and talk to that guy who believes differently than you do. And on top of that, the Ethiopian was a eunuch. <laughs> See, he served the queen of Ethiopia. And uh, a practice that happened in history for men who serve royalty is that they be castrated so as to be able to serve efficiently and not be distracted by sexual urges. So I want you to go to this guy who lives very different from you. And so according to Philip's good Jewish upbringing, this guy, this Ethiopian eunuch was cut off from God, but God's spirit led Philip over to the chariot because he wanted to show Philip this man. And he wanted to show Philip the extent of his great grace and how the church was open even to him. So Philip runs up to the chariot and he hears a eunuch reading from the book of Isaiah and he asks, hey, do you know, do you know what you're reading? And the guy says, uh, I have no clue. Can you explain it to me? And then he invites Philip up into the chariot. And here's what happens. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water 
And the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? See, the question the eunuch asks here is essentially, is there room even for me in God's kingdom? Here's why. Because in the Old Testament law, it says there isn't room for him. In the Old Testament law, it says, nope, not you. I want to read this to you. Now listen, we're going to use some adult words here, okay? Uh, Just reading from the Bible, just reading from the Bible. Bear warning so you know. Deuteronomy 23.1 says, If a man's testicles are crushed or his penis is cut off, he may not be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. This is what has happened to the eunuch. And Deuteronomy 23.1 says, "Uh uh-uh, you're out. So the eunuch is saying, hey, Philip, is there room in the church even for me? Is there space for me? And remember, God's spirit is the one who told Philip to go over to the man and talk to him. Why? Because God's telling him. He's letting him know. Yeah, there's room and there's space and there's grace even for you. So what can stand in the way of my being baptized? Philip's reaction implies that the answer is nothing. Nothing stands in the way because there's room even for you. Nothing stands in the way. Not even that that's happened to you. Acts 8, 38, and he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. See, the ultimate declaration from God through all these different examples is this. My church is open for everyone. My grace is bigger than you can imagine. Regardless of who you are, where you've been, and what you've done, the truth is God loves you. And I don't know who needs to hear that this morning, but this is a word for you that you are loved by God as you are and not as you should be because none of us, none of us, none of us are as we should be. And it took God helping Philip see a person, not a group, It took God helping Philip hear a story, see an experience, to see that his church was open for all people. I want to introduce you to Elena. So, Elena, you're, you're part of our church. You've been part of our church for years. I mean, you were baptized in our church. Yep. And um, you're, you're someone who's come to our church uh, with a different story than most people. <laughs> That's right. Very different. Right? You know, and I'll, I'll just be so open with you. I'm, yeah, um, it's fine. Throughout this series... Um, in this series, we are the church. This is this is one where I'm excited about this series, but I'm also scared in doing this series. I'm excited because I want to use uh, the platform that I have as best I can yeah. to help people see people. Um, and again, we often see people in groups and paint with broad brushstrokes and. Uh, put people into categories and all that stuff. And so what I want to do is I I just really believe that we're called to love our neighbor. I believe we're called to love our enemy. I believe we're called to love people who are like us, who are not like us. Like it's, it's love, right? Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. I think the only way we can love one another is see not groups, but see individuals, see people and hear their stories. And so I'm excited about this series to help uh, put people like you on uh, on a platform in in a, in a space where people can hear your story, hear your experience, but I'm also scared um, because I know we live in a society where it's either I agree with you or disagree with you, and if I disagree with you, I'm done with you, and um, mm, or there's there. yeah <laughs> yeah, and we we live in a society with uh, yeah, but what abouts and 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 we live in a society of judgment. Um, 
So part of me is scared because um, uh, I, I'm hoping people will see this and be open to reflecting on their own thoughts and judgments and assessments and not just write this off or not get mad because uh, when it comes to homosexuality, transgender, and by, by the way, homosexuality and transgender, I'm learning are, are two different things. Totally different things. <laughs> right? Totally. Yeah. T and and I'm that. straight, so yeah. I don't even. I don't, right. I don't and so, so when it comes to things like that, like often the, the quick jump is, but that's wrong. Yeah. And there's this, that's wrong. And, um, you know, I think about a lot of stuff in my life that's wrong. Yeah, that I do. We all have <laughs> wrong things. I mean, we right. all do wrong things right. or dumb things that we've done in the past or whatever. Yeah. And so the question then is, okay, how do we look past that and see God's grace um, and then still love people who are different than us? And so my hope is that that's what people will see in this. My hope is um, too. Tell us about, uh, and, and I remember when, when, when I met you and I had, I had all kinds of questions because I just didn't know. Um, I just didn't know what I didn't know, right? And so, just, I mean, just so people know, you're you're a transgendered woman, and I know when we talked before, you said you don't even like that term transgender. I don't. <laughs> I don't like that term at all. You just, but you it's just, okay. Yeah, you just consider yourself a woman. Yeah. And and I'd love to hear. We'll, we'll talk about why why you don't like that term. And again, it, it groups people. Yeah. It, it's Except really that's it, that label that I don't like. Yeah. It's everything that we're talking about, not seeing groups, but seeing individuals. But um, when we met years ago, I, I just had all kinds of questions about um, this decision to, to go all the way and, and going from being a man to a woman and how, how help, help people understand just your experience uh, growing up. Because I think, I think a lot of questions people have, I, I know questions I had were, what makes someone make that decision? Why would someone do that? It's just a big question mark, right? Yeah. So, so help me understand your experience and how you felt just, just growing up. Of course. Right? So like you mentioned before, transitioning from a man to a woman, to me it was more, I was always a woman. I just presented as a man and then I kind of came out and then everybody saw that transition. So for me, my whole life it was, two lifestyles that I lived. Uh, I lived my hidden lifestyle of being around, you know, men and dating men and being with men. And then I lived the one that I thought society would, you know, require me to be with, which was being with women and kept those two lifestyles separate from everybody because I thought one was right and one was wrong, even though the one that I thought was right was what everybody else thought was wrong. So then when I came out, I kind of got rid of that piece of my life and did what I felt was right. Yeah, so you said, so I mentioned going from a man to a woman, you said, I just felt like I've always been a woman yeah. my whole life. Now, now some people would say, but yeah, but you were born with the anatomy of, of a man. Like you were, you were born that way. So how, how can you be born in this, with the physical anatomy of a man and yet feel like a woman. How would you how would you explain that? So I had a lot of complications at birth as well that were problems leading up to that. So not only was uh, I had problems with, you know, like I almost didn't make it. Uh, I had jaundice. I had, uh, I mean, they broke my shoulder blades to get me out of my mom. Uh, I had some complications as well, and my mom even thought that I, she was having a woman as well, or a baby girl, and when she told me that, it was like the biggest like relief I've ever had or dealt with, because it felt like my whole life that I was always meant to be a woman, and I came out, and my whole world changed. Yeah. So, so some would say, um, uh... Are you saying like God made a mistake then because you were born a certain way and you felt another way? What what would you say to that? How would yeah, you respond? I've, I've heard that before and yeah. I don't feel like God made a mistake. Um, maybe the complication of the birth maybe had something to do with it. Maybe there was some type of 
you know, problem greater than what I know that happened. Yeah. Do I feel like God made a mistake? No, I feel like God made me who I am, and that's kind of yeah. who I am. So yeah, and that's a for that's like a mind blowing thing for me to like for, for me to wrap my mind around that because I I don't know your experience. Yeah, and I haven't of course. I haven't grown up feeling what you feel and knowing what you know, and so when I when I hear that and I think maybe maybe people are like me and hear that they may think. But no, how? But then right. at the same time, I don't know. So, so for people, so for people like, like me, um, who when I when I hear that, there's I'm, like I don't know what that's even like because that's not my experience, and I haven't right. experienced what you experienced, I haven't felt what you felt, so I have no idea. So, so it's it's seeing things. It, it's shifting to see things differently. It, it's like, I think if someone, so, so I'm a heterosexual male, and if somebody were to ask me like, hey, at what point did you know you were a heterosexual male? I'd just be like, well, I just always knew. Yeah. Like there wasn't a point where I knew, I just, I just, I just always knew. So, so when I think about it in those terms, if someone were to ask you, hey, when did you feel this way? Or when did you know? Or when did you make the decision to become a woman? You would say, well, I've just always felt like it's very true. I've it, always felt like that. So, for, so that's a good yeah, parallel then to make, it is. huh? Yeah. And so, um, so, so growing up, w w one of the questions people often ask is, when if, um, and even talking about uh, homosexuality or or someone who's transgendered, sometimes people think, well, something traumatic happened in their life, or something caused them to be this way. Was there any, anything like that for you? Or Not just, growing up, no. no. Other than my birth, there was no traumatic experiences or anything that yeah. pushed me to be that way. It was always, just, I am who I am. This is who it's I am. This is who I am. And you said for so long, you felt like you had to be somebody else. That's correct. And you lived a dual life. Tell us, tell us more about that. So I lived two lives uh, for as long as I can remember, probably far back as five, um, to where I would hide certain aspects about what I thought was right. And then, you know, you learn from society and around other people how you're supposed to act, how you're supposed to be, and that didn't feel like who I was. So then I would hide this other part of my life from mm. everybody forever until I came out and I felt that release come. So me finding God and coming out was almost one in one. It was, it was just like this darkness release from myself and then everything made sense. Everything was right. I cut the other part of my life out. I completely came out. I found God in the same time and here I am. Yeah. So as you were growing up then, you, is it safe to say you felt like an imposter. Yeah, of okay. course. So living a life. Relationships, yeah. friendships, all of it. So living a life you felt was expected from you because, because of um, your, your physical gender and then doing battle with also how you, how you felt inside so you're living this, this dual. How did you feel about yourself when you were living this dual lifestyle? It was very depressive. I, I, had, I went through all kinds of experiences. You know, I tried to escape. I've tried to, you know, release myself through uh, drugs. Uh, you know, I tried to remove my physical, you know, aspect from, from it, trying to cope with living this dual life. Yeah. So, so you were depressed. You said you tried to escape, like through yeah, through drugs. Through and, drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. You just. So it sounds like you had no peace. Yeah. There was no life. no peace. Yeah. And you mentioned to a darkness that you felt. Tell tell me about the darkness. That yeah. Was so in my past, you know, I grew up, you know, kind of, I fell into Satanism. I kind of made sense to me. Uh, I kind of fell into that and went down that path because uh, it allowed me to do basically whatever I wanted to do and not have any guilt or uh, problems with what I was doing. So then as I was guilted into coming to church, which I was, <laughs> I won't <laughs> yeah. lie, um, I, it ended up being the greatest thing and experience that I've ever dealt with. But as I 
came to church, um, I could slowly feel this darkness kind of going away. And then it was just like God was speaking to me, telling me, you know, that I don't need that. You know, I don't need those things. And then all this darkness just slowly just went away. Yeah. And so you, you uh, engaged in uh, drugs and trying to escape, really to try and medicate how you felt. Yeah. To, um, to cope with depression. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. And then when you said, okay, I'm finally going to be me, like I'm going to be my true self, how I feel I am and how I've been for so long, that's when you found freedom. Yep, and exactly. That's when I came in. Gotcha. I had and, nothing but happiness since. It's yeah. crazy since I've come out. So how, help me understand, what about um, if, if someone were to say, yeah, okay, I know you felt that way and feel that way, but why don't you just change that? Like, why don't you just not feel that way or, or why don't you change your thinking or whatever, right? Like, just don't do that. How, how would you respond to that? Yeah, so it's, I wish it was that simple. It's really not <laughs> yeah. that simple. Um, living the dual lifestyle, because yeah. that's what I was doing. Uh, one was right, one was wrong, so I got rid of the wrong one. Yeah. And then that was just like, it was always that way. So everything felt right. And yeah. It wasn't just, you know, oh, one day I chose to be a woman. No, that's not how. So it was never like it was this never choice like that you choice. felt you made. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was just like, this is who I am, and mm -hmm. it's always felt that way. And yeah. then now it's everybody's going to know, everybody's going to see, this is me. Yeah. Blending of that world or whatever, and yeah. getting rid of that darkness. And I think, I think uh, again, I would liken it to if, if someone said to me, like, if being a uh, heterosexual male was wrong and someone said to me, hey, you got to change that, I'd be like, I have no idea how right. to where do to that. Where to start or where to begin or that, any of that. This is yeah. just who I am and this is mm -hmm. what I know and this is, um, so, okay, I can see that. How, and, and, and you even said, as, as you were feeling these things, you were wondering, what's wrong with me, right? And you were feeling that depression, you were feeling like an imposter, and you even you even went to try and like fix yeah, I went and tried what was wrong with it. you. T t tell us about that. Yeah, so I tried to fix the, you know, the wrongness that I thought was wrong, and I went to SAA uh, and tried to fix those situations and problems and all that stuff which to me it didn't feel like it needed to be fixing. I know you go to a, an anonymous group to not help yourself or whatever, but you know, to me it was, they were kind of the wrong and it didn't really help me. It didn't really get me to what I needed. Yeah. Was it beneficial? Maybe, but I didn't feel like there was a problem to fix. Right, yeah. And so, um, so when you made the decision to to come out and go all in uh, and, and, and being who you feel you are. Uh, again, you said you felt this freedom and this light um, pour in, but, but I imagine it's been difficult for you as well. Oh yeah. Um, because, so, so, so tell us about some of the difficulties. Yeah, I've had a lot of difficulties. I've been removed from jobs. I've been fired from jobs. Uh, groups, friends, family. Um, I've had issues with uh, people not communicating to me or don't feel like I'm a person, uh, either male or female. Yeah. They don't treat me as a person at all. So I'm like the lowest thing that they've ever dealt with or talked to. Um, I've had people talk bad to me. I've had situations where I felt very like I was in a dangerous situation and I couldn't get out of it. Um, so like the instance I had, I was doing lift as like a car, you know, the car doing it myself, driving people around. And um, I had a situation where I had a drunk guy get in the car. He was obviously very big and muscular. There was not a lot I could do. And he continued to trash talk me the whole time that he was in the car saying, calling me names, saying bad things. Um, I thought he was gonna physically hurt me, but like I'm in the middle of the ride, what am I supposed to do? If I pull over, 
he's not going to get out. And if he does, what what's going to happen? So yeah. I had to sit there and take it, and I never did it ever again. So yeah. I have tons of situations that are like that. Yeah. What are some other situations? Um, so, for instance, I've had situations where people don't believe me. Uh, like my own, my dad is like that. He doesn't believe it. It's so much to where uh, he's ha said bad things or done bad things or mentioned bad things and completely has left my life. Yeah. Like I had to set that boundary to where I can no longer deal with you anymore and talk to you in that level. So, yeah. Yeah. And there's times I imagine where you, you have to be aware of where you are in your surroundings and situations. Yeah. So like it's for me, I, I, I got to be careful when I go, go somewhere alone. Uh, like for instance, I can't go to just a bar alone sometimes, even though I do it. Um, cause I don't let that rule my life. However, I've had situations where people talk to me in the bar or say bad things or, um, you know, talk to me about bathroom situations or stuff yeah. like that. And it's very frustrating and yeah. scary to be able to not be able to go anywhere that anyone else could on their own. So, so we mentioned earlier uh, the, the term transgender, right? And you said you, you don't like that. So, so what, how do you feel about that and how do you... What do you what do you prefer? What do you how do you identify? Yeah, that? so for me, it immediately puts me in a label or a box or yeah. a category that you already admit that I am not like you. Uh, right. So that's why I don't like it. Uh, a lot of people do like it and embrace it and all that, and that's fine. That's that's your prerogative. But for me, I'm a woman. To me, I want to be classified as such, dealt with such. Yeah. You know, and not segregated out like a transgender person would or a, a special bathroom or a special this or a special that that yeah. you know pe some jobs or people do i don't i don't like that at all yeah so as we talk about bathrooms and this <laughs> I, I imagine that's probably a lot of conversations yeah, people want to have with a you a lot of people do have that conversation <laughs> with me like they're really <laughs> curious about using the yeah. bathroom like <laughs> they think that I'm going to go into the bathroom with some random person and they're going to get... I'm like the most harmless person you've ever right. met. If anybody ever knows me, I'm not... I a, I can't fight. B, <laughs> I can't fight. And there's nothing I'm going to ever say or do to anybody that's really going to yeah. hurt or do anything. So, and I think the concern... And, and so now from hearing from your perspective, it, it, it's enlightening. I think the concern people have, and I know it was in the news uh, several years back about um, transgender bathrooms or... Yeah, no, I've heard bathrooms, it all. <laughs> is that people think, oh, but you're a man yeah. going into a woman's bathroom and you're saying, no, hello, my whole life, I felt like a woman. Yeah. I'm a woman going into a woman's bathroom. Exactly. And so that's just how you feel from the essence. And so there's no like, oh yeah, I wanna go into a women's bathroom and yeah. see women. It's like, no, I have a woman. Perspective of both, I've been in both. They're yeah. both dirty. Right. So don't even, <laughs> don't even say they're not. They're yeah. both dirty. I've been in both. Yeah. So. So Elena, what would you say, um, what would you tell someone who, who just doesn't understand or has questions about um, transgendered people in general? Yeah, well, for one, if anybody wants to talk to me about any of it, they are more than welcome to. I will yeah. mention or talk or tell my story. And you've um, been so open with that. Yeah, which is I've been great. so. It doesn't. It's part of who I am. We gotta. That's what helps people come to church. Where. You know, I don't let anything hold me back. Yeah. Uh, but if anybody has anything or worried or any of that, I'm just a woman like any other woman that you've ever dealt with. And sometimes even more so than women that I know. So. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Like I mentioned in the beginning, you are the church. You're, you're part of this church. And I love the way that you've jumped in. You serve. You give of yourself. Yeah. Um, don't miss a week. Yeah. And, um, and I just love how you take ownership in being the church. And uh, you know, the scriptures say that 
every, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and that in heaven it's made up of people of different tribes, tongues, and nations. Um, and uh, I think there will be a lot of people who don't look like us, think like us, live like us, who will be in heaven because they've accepted Jesus, because they've said yes to him. And they are the church. And um, I'm just so glad you're part of this movement and that you're Me part too. of this church. Me too. <laughs> Me too. And if anybody wants to talk about any of it or wants to know any more of my story, they're more than welcome yeah. to reach out. Um, but as far as what you were saying with judgment, I get a lot of judgment from a lot of people, mostly primarily Christians over regular people um, as well. So if anybody is on the fence about that, yeah, yeah. you can talk to me about it if you cool. like. Well, I appreciate you being so open. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. And... Um, I appreciate you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>Hey, thanks so much for tuning in. I am so grateful you got to tune in and I pray that it inspired you, encouraged you and motivated you to grow closer to God. You know, I am so grateful for every single person who goes all in by giving back to God, supporting this ministry financially. If you've been blessed and encouraged by the work of this ministry, I wanna invite you to take a step to give if you haven't already or if you've been giving, continue to give because as you give, it allows us to continue to get God's word out to more and more people. Hey, make sure you check us out on wearetherising.com. Again, I'm so grateful you tuned in and uh, I pray that you have a great week as you apply what you've heard. What we know is that the best is yet to come.